Do you want to do some of the, uh, by the way, first of all, does anybody want to, yeah, there's a question. Can you just wait until you get the microphone? Because I think they want to get this kind of stuff on camera. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Jerry. Hi. Right. Uh, I'd just like to ask you, um, obviously your work is, involves huge detail, and as you mentioned, there's health and safety aspects. So how much time do you get to prepare, uh, maybe not just reading the script, but before the movie actually starts, how early do you get involved? Well, um, it could be days. It could be days, it could be weeks, it could be months. It depends on what the movie is. If it's a big, usually a big film, you get uh, plenty of warning. Um, I was working on, years ago when I started, I was working six months before we ever seen a camera. Um, so it depends really, yes, the quicker we get the script about, break it down, and then, then you start sort of finding out what you need, and then you communicate them with maybe people abroad or wherever we are working. So it depends really what the, what the, uh, the film is about. The likes of Braveheart, we didn't get very much time on that. You know, and either uh, private, Saving Private Ryan wasn't much time on that. I wasn't privy to the script. I didn't get the script uh, like six months because I was only came for the Irish end of it where we were shooting in Ireland. So I just was involved in the first 20 minutes, half an hour of the movie. I wasn't involved then after that. You know. So again, I had the script about four or five weeks before that, you know? So some of the other people, uh, some of the other supervisors maybe had it about three or four months before that. Hi, I just wanted to ask, um, what got you into special effects and did you have to do special training or did you learn as you went along? I actually fell into the business. Um, it all started when I was about nine and 10. Um, I, uh, I, I, I was making up bows and arrows, used to play cowboys and Indians, made my own arrows. Um, <coughs> then I decided that I got fed up with bows and arrows and I started making up my own uh, little explosives. <laughs> uh, so I started, uh, I used to go off my own and plant them in trees and blow lumps out of trees. And then after that, then um, uh, that's what I used to do. And then I went into science class, and um, that's when we started to uh, uh, experiment. We used to use gas, magnesium. We used to fill up the balloons with gas, and then we'd sort of put a little uh, fuse on them. We'd make up our own little fuse, <coughs> and they'd be floating just in the science class. The next thing be a big explosion. <laughs> And the, the science class scene was all blackened and that, and then we nearly died because the teacher came in at the time and sort of gave out, and how did this happen? So we eventually had to, we had to tell him eventually what we were doing and that. So that was, uh, so I started doing that. And then um, I started then, I went off and I started uh, my first job doing engineering. And it was like my, my father knew I wasn't happy what I was doing. So he met a colleague of his, and he said he was working on a movie. And uh, my father said, I think you should go out to Ardmore Studios and see this, this particular guy. So I went out anyway, and he introduced me a couple of these uh, supervisor directors at the time, had a meeting with them, and uh, they asked me to come back again. And I went back the second time, and they said, be in contact. And that was on a, I think that was a few days before. And then on a Monday morning, I got a knock on the door, the bell rang, and there was a big black limo outside. And there was a guy dressed as a chauffeur, and he said, Mr. Johnston, I'm here to take you to Ardmore. And took me to Ardmore, and uh, never looked back. And I loved, I loved what I'm doing. Yeah. That's an answer. Here's the question here, the front row. Um, what is the hardest um, special effect to do? What would the hardest special effects? Well, it could be the kettle boiling over at the right time. <laughs> yeah. Or it can, be, uh, it can be something very dangerous. The most dangerous thing is always when we're using explosives, whether it's what we call HE, which is a high explosive, or uh, low explosives would be having to do with chemicals and powders. But the hardest thing can be a, a cake rising at the, at, the, at the right time, like a mother cooking a, uh, a cake and she sees a rise and she says, I must test that or whatever. So that can be sometimes the hardest. Right on cue is to have that cake rising, you know. So it depends, really. You know. Timing. Yeah. Anybody else got a question? Go ahead. Hiya. Um, is special effects a hard 
profession to like get into really? Like, do you need to build up a lot of experience before directors will like trust you or whatever? Uh, no, it's not really hard to. It's, uh, nowadays, it's not because you have um, you have colleges now. Um, to be a special effects person, you've got to be creative. Uh, it's hard work. And if you have a background of engineering or, uh, or, or science or whatever, it's, it's, uh, it's not a bad start. But to, it, you've got to be imaginative and, it, and creativity. And be like you're going to create the illusions, because that's what special effects is about, creating illusions on screen that no one is hurt and that, that no one sees behind the scene the wires and things. Yeah, like Jerry, that. in terms of what, you, what Jerry does in this book, seriously, it's really hard work. It's not nice work, a lot of it. It's terrible hours. It's underwater. It's like you've, there's one scene you say, I can't remember what the movie was, and you have a Morris Minor. There's a great picture of it in the book. And the Morris Minor's gone over this cliff and it's on fire. And obviously, you only get one shot at that. But then later on, because it's debris and you're making a movie, he's got to go down. Like, there should have been five guys going down there in wetsuits to get this Morris Minor up. He's the only guy down there. They're trying to put this big hook on with the waves coming in. You realize you didn't have time because it was going to go out to sea. And he has to do it all by himself. Like, Sorry, I'd rather be doing my job than yours. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's not easy. Well, it's not stuff. easy. It's a tough job. You got, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, as I said, when it was breaking the bottle, you've you got to be strong. You know? uh, it's tough um, because you're pushed to the limit what you can do. And you'll always be pushed to the limit by directors that say, I want the house to really blow up. And you've got yeah. to sort of say, well, sorry, this is what you, you're going to get. Well, giving him the same effect. But they'll always push that push it, push it, push it. But like what Dave was saying about uh, the Morris Minor going over the cliff is uh, for, I was told then, you're going to have to get away this Morris Minor for uh, environmental purposes, you know. So I had to go down on the water with a snorkel and put a massive big hawser around this uh, Morris Minor on a my own. A job for five people. It was a job for four or five people. And, and I broke the rule then and I swore I'd never break it again because it could have torn me because this trawler was above the surface and I was diving, I had no aqualung and I was diving down and I had to manage this, it nearly killed me to get the hawse around it. But we got it up but I'd never do it again. But to be really cruel about it, one of the worst things is that a lot of these guys don't care too much about you with all due respect, they just want the shot, they want you to get paid whatever wage you're meant to no. get paid but no. do what you're told and get it no. done. It's not the nicest gig in terms of the way you've been treated by a lot of people. No, you're only, you're, you're like, a, you're only a number. Yeah. You know, yeah, exactly. and if someone gets killed, it's, oh, it's, you know, I'm very sorry. Can we get, push them asunder? Can we get on to shoot? That's the way it's got. It's, it's like, it's run by accountants and insurance people now. And that's what sort of, uh, the niceness has, a lot of the niceness God, gone out of the movie. That's a really terrible answer. You know? I mean, there's, there's an awful lot of good things in the book too. We're there's really a, yeah, there is, here. yeah. There's but an awful just, lot of exciting yeah. things about it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a great yeah. gig. Yeah. Um, there was one over here, wasn't there? No, yeah, we've got a microphone there, yeah. Uh, Jerry, yeah, just um, a couple of questions kind of linked. Um, just interested in hearing what you want to do next, because you were saying you wanted to go into maybe it was directing or producing, and then also kind of linked onto that, is there any advice you could give, say, uh, new younger filmmakers, perhaps working in low budget features or no budget features in relation to special effects? Well, you know, um, for young directors and us to, um, there's many, many books on special effects now and there's also on the internet. Um, so it, it's, if, like I mean, many of the director or producers rang me and said, look, we're thinking of doing a movie. We're not too sure how to do these shots. Or I might get a call from a writer saying, I don't know how to put this in. What do you think is the best thing to do and how do we go about it to get it into the script? Um, and, it, it's a lot, of, uh, a lot of producers and directors up and coming, they've maybe gone through college <coughs> and they feel like, oh, well, we know how to do this and everything like that. But when it's totally different when you get on the, on the stage, as they say. Uh, it's a totally different thing what you learn in school and classes and colleges. When you come out in the real world, it's a totally different thing. But I think it's always as good to, you know, it's just not to be, uh, well, I know it all, and the producer, director, and that, and sort of, you know, it's just don't be afraid to ask people that's in the business, you know. And that's what I'd say to anyone, young film director or, or producers coming up, is don't be afraid to ask questions, you know. Because, you know, it's simple enough. We, we just... You sound like you're making something, and you've been as far as the joke shop, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs>
Um, who, sorry, have you, have you got a microphone? Oh, he does. Yeah, good man yourself. Anybody else want to ask a question? By the way, he has a few over here. Do you want to get? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, hi. Um, what do you um, think was the the best stunt that you did? The best the stunt best, that you did. The best film I did. No, the best stunt that you did. The oh, best the thing you did in the movie. The one you're most well, proud of. Well, I, I, I don't do stunts. Um, well, I, I do the special effects, but I make sometimes I make the stunt guys look good. Because I create the fire around them and would I throw them in the air. Would there be one saying, look, I did all that. He wouldn't have been able to fall that way or die that way or whatever. Um, um, well, it was a shot we did in the... Uh, 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 we did a shot, like, for instance, uh, in the Great Train Robbery, the first Great Train Robbery, and the stunt coordinator, um, he jumped the wrong way. He should have jumped when the train is, is going. It's when it's going that direction, he should have jumped that way. And of course, he jumped that way and he broke his shoulders and arms and everything like that. And what, that was, what was so great about that? It was, <laughs> no, I'm just saying, sort of, like, it was, it, that was a, that was a, that was a, a, no one particularly liked this particular guy, and it was a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> he, and I think, Dave, you may be mad at him at the time, you know. But oh, the, uh, the, one of the, I think one of my, one of my favourites was when I, Worked with uh, Pierce Brosnan the first time was I blew up a gunpowder factory, one of the biggest in America, and I was I was uh, I was uh, chieved about how it looked and how no one was hurt. Right. You know, and that was uh, a seven or eight story big factory. What's the movie? It was it was, it was, uh, it was Pierce Brosnan the first time it was called Manions of America. Oh yeah, Manions of America. And it, that was the first time Pierce then became famous. Yeah. Uh, he then went off to America and then after that he did Remington Steel. Well, and can I just say something on that level too about somebody coming famous first? Um, you did a small movie in County Kerry, which I think you got yourself involved in. To kind of answer your question earlier on about like, you know, what you're going to do next, you're going to get into directing or get into making movies on a different level than what you're doing now. And you made a thing called Drinking Crude. And um, it didn't make it, it didn't do anything. It wasn't successful as such, right? It was the first movie ever that Colin Farrell was in. It was, the, yeah, we had, uh, birth, yeah, that was the first, we did that back in 19, we shot it back in 1996. Uh, we, we, bombed, we bought and robbed, borrowed and everything to make the movie. Yeah. It was in 84, uh, we shot it on Super 16, we blew it up on 35. And, um, uh, and it's the main actor was uh, Andrew Scott and Eva yeah. Bertissel, who is, well, they're doing very well today. And we had this part, this guy playing a cameo, uh, Colin Farrell and I wanted the director to maybe use him as the lead part but the director at the time thought no that we use Andrew Scott at the time um, and I kept saying to him no why not use this guy no he said no we only use him but uh, we only had him in about 10 minutes and uh, we, then we know what happened after that Colin Farrell became famous but at the time we made the movie for I think of at the time as uh, for a grant from the uh, from the film board, and we made it for about two hundred thousand. But it got great ratings at the time, and yeah. and thankful to Dave here gave us uh, two reviews on television, and yeah, uh, gave it good. great reviews. And we got a we got a few little sales out of it, but we had got the money to push it and to uh, promote the movie. And we had a particular friend of mine who never had a feature before, and he asked me to give it to him, and he. He gave it to him, but he, he was out of his league at the time and he hadn't got the resources to do it. And um, we get, I often get an inquiry about what are you going to do with this movie. So we were asked there recently, would we go back and reshoot and put Colin Farrell, but you couldn't do it because he was only, uh, he was only about 20 odd at the time. Yeah. You know, he was very young. 12 you know, years ago, yeah. 12 years ago. For a question yeah. there, yeah. Just in the film industry in general, being on set for actors and uh, directors and producers and special effects, um, inevitably there's going to be um, dates pu pushed back and that. Is it true that it's an area you can't afford to be sensitive in? Sorry, you could, uh, your question basically yeah, is... Ju just um, in the film industry, um, there's inevitably going to be dates have to be pushed back and extend to deadlines. Is it true that it's an area in general that you can't afford to be sensitive in with tensions and that? You mean, if, well, if you mean, well, it depends on really, as for the actors to push days back. Um, and um, your other question is sort of as regards pushback effects? Datelines being have inevitably having to be extended, and that, and I mean tensions will inevitably rise at some point. I mean, is this 
you can't afford to be sensitive to criticism and well uh, maybe it's your answer to your question I'm not too sure if this is the answer but I mean as regards the um, the effects most effects is always the end of the day they always call you out very early in the morning but you know and then they want to either the actor to uh, survive or the set to stay stay up because at the end of the day it might be blowing the set up or whatever it is so they want to get everything else shot uh, so often they extend the day um, and that then sort of causes uh, maybe budget constraints for the production company and that because then they have to there is a certain time you uh, you only get maybe a, a 10 hour day if you start going over that then you're into overtime you might have to pay certain people double time and into next day and that but yes it, it they often you know as it's often pushed back maybe some of the effects is pushed back the following day or, or that but it's all sort of what's happening on the day really does that answer your question right. <coughs> Um, I just wanted to know, have the technological advances over the last few years made your job harder or easier, like the green screens and the computerization of effects? Has it made your job easier or harder? You mean like, uh, the uh, uh, computer generated yeah. effects? Well, I don't do computer, I do the physical Oh, you effects. mentioned the dirty word right. there. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, um, I mean, like my colleagues and, and that and actors, we seem to be going back to what happens on the set. Uh, as regards, there's a, there's a place for uh, computer generated effects still and uh, green, screen, green screen but um, we tend to be sort of going back, directors now want to go back because first <coughs> of all the actors and the actresses on the set and if there's action they feel part of it and the movement and everything like that. When you're shooting on green screen or whatever then computer, for computer generated effects um, the actors and actors feel the phone has gone out of it or they're, what are they supposed to be doing? They're, there's no one around them and they don't know what's going on when it gets into the, uh, the computer generated stuff. So they prefer working on the set and this communication with the crews and rapport and that. So And there is the line that was on the screen there at the very last line of the whole book where you say, <coughs> yeah. my dreams of adventure have been fulfilled, computer generation, generated fires, rain and explosions still look fake. But before technology catches up, I would like to echo one of Hollywood's greats who paid tribute to the work of the special effects professionals. He said, the audience is treated to the results, but I have smelled the cordite, seen the hidden wires, and experienced the meticulous and personal care for the safety of everybody without compromising the finished effect. Thank you, Steven Spielberg. So you have Steven Spielberg and a few others. As I said at the very beginning, it's coming back, isn't it? It's you coming guys, back, yeah. 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 The real deal. I mean, uh, even Spielberg used to, is, is um, okay, he's, he's going back to, he used to use a lot of CGI himself. And yeah, he's yeah, going yeah, back yeah, to yeah, now. It's, I mean, most, a lot of, lot of directors and production yeah. companies and, and um, you know, and some of the big uh, moguls in Hollywood, they're going yeah, back exactly, to that. Yeah. You know? Wasn't there a question up there? There yeah. you go, yeah. Hi, how's it going? Um, you said that insurance, and the insurance industry are kind of taking the fun out of it. Um, well, maybe not the fun, but they're putting more restrictions. Do you think that's preventing the creativity that could be there? Sorry? Do you think the whole insur insurance industry and the whole idea that it is being turned over to accountants and people that are sitting in an office looking at numbers and looking at risk are actually taking out the creativity yeah, that used to exist? Yeah, it's all gone very to and nanny yeah. and all that. Well, yeah, well, it, it's like sort of, you know, it's, um, health, and, health and safety now is, plays a huge part in every industry. And it has restricted a lot of, I'm not saying it's restricted, but there's more paperwork, there's more uh, uh, safety aspect. There's, I mean, when I started in it, there was, okay, you had a, if we were blown up in a place, we had a nurse on set. <laughs> you might have an ambulance, <laughs> but nowadays, yeah, you know, nowadays you've got to take into consideration, and, and it's, it's part of your call because you have to do risk assessments for every time you're going out nearly now. And this is it's more paperwork, the paperwork, and that. And also, as well as regards, like you were saying, accountants. I mean, they at the end of the day, uh, most producers. I mean, I wear I wear I wore the hat myself as a producer. At the end of the day, the cost factor. But you're caught between two stools because the director might say, I want a jumbo jet to blow up. I want two. You know, I want just one in case we don't get the first shot. So then I have to go back and I have to talk to the production counter, the producer, and they say, no. 
you, we've no money. We're, you're not getting that. You know, so go back and tell the director. You know, she's not getting it. Now you got, then you've got to go back and say, can't so you cut between the t two people here, like production area and uh, the creativity. Um, so what often happens at the end of the day is a lot of effects, imagination, the illusions are cut out because the, the producer will say, well, okay, you're the accountant, um, and the accountant just slash, 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 you know? So at the end of the day, sort of, if you can cut in other corners that mightn't be, uh, you know, uh, mightn't be uh, relevant to the, to the movie, do it that way, but don't sort of cut what the director wants and what's good for the movie, you know? Yeah. Can we take one more, maybe, if there's, any, if there's any more, or is there any more? I don't see it. Here's one here, if we can get a mic down. There's, although you, you, can, you can shout if you like, because you can certainly hear shout. you. <laughs> um, I was basically wondering, um, throughout your career, which uh, stunt or which film would you be most proud of having been working on? Well, um, there's a lot of them, it's very difficult to say, but I suppose the one I had feeling for, because it was there, I lived it and everything like that, and I felt, I was in war, it was uh, Saving Private Ryan, you know. The rest, were, uh, the rest were movies as such, but when you have people crying behind you, and you have people sniffing... And so you're talking about the impact on Curran Club Beach, as opposed to the impact about, in, in the cinemas, oh, uh, while you were there making it? While I was making it, yeah. I mean, I felt like, you know, that was my favourite favorite movie that I worked on, uh, <coughs> that I felt I was there, and looking at the screen, I was crying nearly behind the scene, you know. Oh, anybody else will believe it at that? Yeah, just a quick comment. The, the explosion at the very beginning of In the Name of the Father was one of the most stunning things I've ever seen. It's not a question, it's just to tell you. It was just, you're, you're sitting there, you're watching it, and my God. That's the pub in Guildford, is it? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I've never seen anything like it. I yeah, that was it. really powerful. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, you see, again, sort of, you know, as you build a set that we can blow out, but sometimes we have to blow out. It. There's a pub there, but then we have to put a false set in front and blow it out. You know, it's, 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 it's within the uh, landscape of that. But we use, um, it depends really, we, you know, it's, it's nice for us if we can get a derelict building. Uh, we can really go to town on it then. We can do what we like, you know. <laughs> uh, if, if it's a set that's built and we have to have it next day, well then you have, we have to sort of compromise to a certain extent. And then we uh, might have a set that's out in the wilderness that we could just blow the whole thing up. And it doesn't have to be concrete, it's, it's sort of, stuff we can make up that looks like concrete at the whole second, either disintegrate or wall blown out, you know. So um, every depends on what the firm is about, you know, what is. Uh, can I just ask you, sorry, you, you do your pyrotechnics and then the director says, whatever, you know, go or whatever they say, and then it goes wrong and the set has blown up and gone on fire. Sorry, just go back on that again. You know, again. if you're doing your pyrotechnics and you're blowing something up. Yeah and they say, go ahead and do your job, and then they say, that wasn't quite right. You know, that wasn't exact, it wasn't quite, quite what, right. What then. you wanted. What happens then if it's well, blown up and... Well, either that or they, they, uh, either that or they uh, go and build another set or another whatever it is. But normally what I do, and this is what I always make it my business if I can, because if I'm working with art departments, uh, I, we normally work through art department because we come in, the makeup, the wardrobe, the special effects and everything comes under the umbrella of the art department. And the production designer, the art director might have an idea how this should look. But then the director might have a different concept of how they want it. So I always try and make it my business to go to the director <coughs> to make sure that this is what they want. And you know, some, I've never had any problem with that. You know, it's always it's always good because if I had it went with what the art director said, that's not what, what the director wanted. You know, so I always try and go and say, I'll say to the art departments, I'm going to talk to the director about it because I always like to sort of find out what way they want it, their feeling, what they want to see, and what they can help them. And then I might say, well, listen, my suggestion would be, you know, that I can maybe compromise for them, and and they feel happy with that. Mm. All right, folks, lights, camera, dynamite. Let's hear it for Jerry Johnston. <laughs> <laughs>